like to update the board on the planning process the district has been involved in uh, to prepare for the uh, 2021 school year. Uh, we have taken direction from the governor's uh, layout of the red, yellow, and green plans. The uh, red plan uh, really is uh, the buildings are closed and all education is taking place virtually. The yellow phase does open things up a little bit, uh, but still uh, what I would consider highly restrictive. The green phase uh, loosens things up even to the extent that uh, we should be able to uh, operate as near, uh, as near to normal as possible. And I, I'm using that word uh, loosely, normal. Uh, but we are, uh, so we did break our, uh, our planning committee into three groups. One group uh, was uh, headed by Dr. Murray, and that is the red phase, and that is the phase where all learning is taking place uh, virtually online. We had a yellow phase uh, committee chair, that was uh, Dr. Rockland. Uh, she was, uh, along with uh, her committee, uh, charged with vetting out various uh, options and uh, different scenarios. Uh, should we open school uh, while we are still in a yellow phase condition with the restrictions that are in place under that? And then we had uh, Mr. Hunter and Mr. Boyer heading up our green phase uh, uh, committee, which really has to do with students and staff being back in the building and what safety protocols and what changes need to be in place uh, to prepare for students returning uh, uh, in person uh, here in the district. Altogether, we had over 65 uh, committee members serving on these three committees. Uh, we had a broad cross-section of individuals uh, across the district. We have uh, a scheduled board meeting on July 20th to, uh, to uh, receive board approval on these plans. Until then, we will, we will be providing weekly updates uh, on the work of each committee for the board. Uh, if you have uh, comments on that, please uh, contact me directly and I'll vet those comments, questions uh, from the board uh, as you're receiving those weekly updates to the proper committees. And uh, so if you can contact me, if you have any input, questions uh, about the planning process or what you're seeing in the planning documents as we go forward. So we do have a July 20th board meeting to approve those plans. And as I said, uh, we will continue to provide updates uh, for those plans. Um, we will also put together a, a means by which we can receive community feedback on the plans as we're developing those. Uh, that will be handled through uh, some uh, some extraordinary technology would allow us, which allows people to uh, comment online. Uh, so, and Mr. Rizzo will be heading up that little piece of it, how we receive uh, comment back from the community. Um, I will say that uh, of the three full uh, of the three subcommittees, um, uh, they've done an excellent job uh, laying this out. We are trying to handle a tremendous amount of variables the conditions that we're uh, having to plan for are changing uh, daily. Uh, we continue to get uh, input from the state. I know that the first uh, PDE came out with a planning document for us, but it was a version one. They fully expected that document to change. And so um, we've been working off that primarily. We've also taken a look at some of the guidance that our surrounding counties have given us as far as how to plan for this. Uh, reopening. Uh, but as I said, we do have three functioning uh, committees uh, led by these uh, individuals. Without further ado, what I want to do is we want to take a little bit of time to go through uh, where we're at with each of the committees. So what will happen now is uh, each committee chair will come up and share with you their work uh, in their committee and the process they're going by and where we're at basically to give the board an update and the community an update on what the planning process is. Please understand that there's a lot of questions that we can't answer right now uh, about how these things will look. But as the summer plays out, and certainly as we get closer to July 20th, uh, we should have a clear understanding of what exactly we're gonna be facing. Uh, there are lots of questions out there. Uh, we've received lots of questions. We've received lots of comments. People want to know, are kids gonna to have to receive, 
uh, return to school wearing masks. Uh, you know, that there's just a lot of questions out there that we are having to uh, vet out, get input on, get guidance from our uh, county health departments. And uh, obviously uh, we're looking to what other districts are doing as well. So uh, we're not afraid to borrow good ideas uh, as we're moving in this, but uh, we do have uh, the three committee chairs or the four committee chairs that are gonna come up and share a little bit about what's been going on uh, under their purview uh, for the planning of the reopening for next year. So we'll start off with Dr. Murray. And uh, just a library reminder, uh, she had the task of looking at what if we're not back in school? What if we're online again for the beginning of the school year and what that might look like? And so I'll hand it over to Dr. Murray. Good evening, it's nice to see everyone again in person. Um, as Dr. Gooden mentioned, I had the um, privilege of chairing the full school closure committee in looking at the continuation of essentially what we've been doing the last several weeks, um, but really reflecting on that and seeing what worked and what didn't, where we need to make some improvements. Our committee consisted of about 24 members, which included teachers and included building administrators from all levels, um, special education, ELD, human resources, technology, um, communications department, instructional coaches, and curriculum supervisors. Um, what we wanted to do is make sure that we really had a robust reflection of um, without, throughout the district and making sure that we're looking through the various lenses. Our goal was to currently, to reflect on the current practices um, of our online learning and what has been occurring over the last few weeks, identify what worked well and what areas we needed to improve on so that moving forward, we'd have a solid plan for the fall. Um, we are considering two different options. The first option is um, the full cyber for students, for all students in the event that we are under a um, school closure mandate. Um, and this would include a K to 12 option for students. Um, again, similar to what we're currently doing. Um, the other option that we've also considered is uh, um, offering a full in-district cyber option for students regardless what phase we're in. We recognize that there's gonna be families who are not ready regardless of what system we have in place who may or may not be ready to send their children to school in the fall. So we wanted to make sure that there's going to be a, a full cyber option that is in district run by our teachers for those families in the fall. Our major areas of focus that our um, committee has been looking at has been the instructional resources that we've been using, the practices and the procedures, um, discussions about live instruction, and also social emotional learning. One of the first things that our committee did was design three surveys to send out to parents and guardians, students and staff so that we can fully understand um, the scope of how the online learning practices occurred over the last 11 weeks. We certainly had speculations, we heard some feedback along the way, but we wanted to make sure we had a really robust um, feedback from, from all constituents regarding that. Um, we had an excellent response to our surveys. Um, and what we found for students, the top challenges were time management, technical problems, internet connectivity, shared devices, and missing their friends and classmates, I think was probably one of the most um, consistent piece that we, we, we discovered. Um, the top challenges that parents and guardians reported was um, motiva motivating their child to complete schoolwork at home and balancing their own work um, with helping and supporting their students at home as well. We fully recognize that this is not a model that our community chose. It's not a model that our students or our families chose and or for the district that we did either. We were really forced into this model and I think that definitely plays a, um, a, a major role within this. Um, so our subcommittee is focusing on the major trends that, uh, that arose from the survey. Um, and the first and foremost is the live interactions with teachers and, and peers. This was not only related to instruction, but more that social emotional piece and just being able to have the interaction with their peers. We are certainly talking about the live lessons versus recorded lessons. And what's interesting is that we saw a discrepancy in the survey data between what the parents and guardians were reflecting. They wanted more live instruction and the students were actually saying they preferred the, the recorded sessions over live um, instruction for certain grade levels, not all grade levels. Um, so we are looking at how we can offer both and offer a more robust model regarding that. Um, we're looking at organization and consistency. I think this is one of the areas that our teachers struggled with as well with Google Classroom and, and how we organize and how we deliver the lessons um, and how that's user friendly for both the teacher, the student and the families to navigate. 
One of the areas that we, um, we haven't really dabbled in in the last 11 weeks, um, but is certainly something that came up very often was just the socialization piece. If we are in this environment again, can we look, we are, all of our forces, we're trying to get academics up and making sure that we can continue that academic momentum as much as possible, but we're looking for options to be able to just give kids an opportunity to interact with each other and have some of that social peer-to-peer -peer -peer inter interactions um, and the social emotional supports as well. Um, and finally, the, um, the last pieces that we're looking into further is the technology device access. Um, last week when we, or two weeks ago when we presented to the curriculum committee, there was a request to bring some preliminary budget items. Um, I will say that in our process, this, um, one of the hard pieces about this is not knowing which phase we're going to be in. Um, but the first piece that we've been really looking into is the learning management system. Um, I'd like to take a step back and talk for a moment pre-COVID. This is actually something that Bob Catalano and I started the ball rolling before, um, before COVID hit. We were looking at, um, for those of you who don't know, a learning management system is a platform similar to Google Classroom, but it organizes, um, it organizes your lessons, it provides grading opportunities, very similar to Google, but uh, some more functionality. This is a piece that we had been looking at before COVID to integrate with, um, within the lessons, within instruction, within the classroom. Um, and Bob and I had a plan to roll this out over time, but once COVID hit, we said, okay, maybe we need to fast forward this. Um, one of the recommendations we will likely be making is the adoption of a learning management system, a full learning management system. And we would be looking at making that recommendation regardless of which phase we go back into. As I mentioned earlier, a learning management system can be supported whether or not our students are here full time. Um, it can be a resource that's used naturally within instruction, or it can then be turned and the switch can flip and have something ready to go um, if we were to move into the red then at that point. Um, so we have um, not only the, the license and the ability to set that up, but also um, making sure that we have a lot of implementation support and professional development with that. One of the areas that did come up in the survey um, was device access. Um, our technology team did a phenomenal job of collecting the need and we tried to make the ratio as best as we could by deploying many of our devices, nearly all of them, um, over the last 11 weeks. But this is something that did come up within, um, <clears throat> within the survey. Now, moving forward to next year, um, we're confident that grades 8 through 12 all will have a device. Um, that is something that will be in place regardless. Um, so our primary focus with this would be K to 7. Um, and again, if we were to go into the red, looking at that device piece, um, just to make sure that we have, we have access. Along with that, internet expenses um, as well. It was not a huge trend that we saw that um, everyone did not have reliable internet, but um, that was a piece that I know our technology department worked to support as well. Um, Zoom is one of the resources that we used. Um, this year we were, we were able to use that as a free resource. Um, if we were, we don't know whether or not Zoom's gonna continue offering that as a free resource. So we did wanna put that out there that if we need to move forward with Zoom again, there may be an associated cost. <clears throat> The other piece we're looking at is um, various instructional resources that we typically would not have <clears throat> if we were in the classroom, um, but maybe will support some of our instruction. And what that would do would actually alleviate some of the um, pressure from teachers to have to write every piece of their lesson so that it frees their time up to do more of that live instruction. So we're really looking at how we can get potentially some really high quality content that might be pre-made. So it just smooth, smooths that transition for our teachers and allows them more time to work with students. Um, we're also investigating devices such as swivel cameras. Um, if we are um, able to bring our teachers in and have them teach from their classroom, a camera within the classroom might be able to facilitate that live interaction a little bit better. Um, and then finally, our professional development piece, which would um, have to be a factor regardless which phase we're in. Um, but thankfully, we do have funding that um, would support our, our um, professional development. So we do have that within Title II, um, but that's something that we are certainly looking at regardless which phase we're in. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Rockland for the hybrid model. Before Dr. Rockman comes up, I'd like to just bring your attention or draw your attention to the fact that we're very aware that aspects of each of these three plans are going to overlap. There's overlap in them. There are things that, for example, the, the swivel cameras to provide to facilitate live instruction. Uh, uh, Dr. Murray just mentioned about our uh, staff coming in and teaching from their classroom. 
even if students aren't uh, in, uh, you know, aren't on students aren't on campus, and that would be in the yellow phase uh, that Dr. Rockland's going to talk to us about. But my point is, that you'll see aspects of each plan that overlap, and we're, and we're very aware of that. Good evening, everyone. I am Heidi Rocklin, and I am here to talk about the progress that our group has made in the hybrid model. So the assumption that our youngest and most vulnerable learners need the most support provided by face-to-face -face instruction during these uncertain times has been the guiding principle for the hybrid or yellow committee. With this in mind, the hybrid reopening committee continues to vet various scenarios through our multi-layer process of feasibility. Since the last time we met, the following scenario, which is multi-tiered and highly dependent on a multitude of other factors, has emerged as the most feasible moving forward. A half-day scenario for K-4 to that includes attendance every day for every student, but on a modified schedule, which means bringing in half the population at a time for a period of instruction that would equal about a half day. This scenario scenario can be run most easily and at the least cost to the district if students in grades 5 to 12 remain mostly online with only students who are identified as high needs and or at risk attend in person. If we extend the half day scenario to include grades 5 and 6, this can most likely be accommodated but the costs increase most notably for transportation. If we further extend an in-person scenario to grades 7 to 12, it would most likely take the form of an AB day split with the transportation costs increasing again, if this level of transportation can even be met. It is important to note that this scenario is ever changing based on guidelines that emerge from the county and state. We continue to run models and vet scenarios for scheduling and transportation to assess feasibility. So regardless of which scenario we decide on as a district, all teachers will teach from their classrooms, even if offering virtual instruction in a yellow or hybrid model. When students are not in face-to-face -face instruction, they will be offered a schedule of synchronous and asynchronous instruction for all grades K to 12 uh, would be supported with this type of learning. So overarching health and safety guidelines that we know at this point, cafeterias and shared spaces will not be used to the extent feasible um, in, in most of our buildings. Lunches would be served grab and go style at all levels, especially K to four in a half day scenario, students would pick up their lunches and take them home or uh, principals would fig figure out a schedule where students could grab their lunch beforehand and eat it before instruction starts. Um, Masks, the decision on masks, they would be worn in accordance with state and county guidelines at the time. We all know that the guidance keeps changing on masks, so uh, it would be our intention to follow whatever guidelines are put out by the state or county at the time. In our plan, um, you know, the biggest focus is for us to be able to socially distance students to the extent possible according to state and county guidelines, um, as well as recommendations from the Spring Forward Facilities Department as we move forward. So potential budgetary needs that we're looking at in a plan like this. Transportation is the biggest factor affecting uh, the feasibility of a, plan, of, of, uh, a yellow scenario. Um, in any scenario beyond only bringing in K to four students, we would incur transportation costs of $33 an hour for each additional run added to the current schedule. That totals, if we're talking about, um, let's say five additional hours a day for 111 runs, uh, it's about $20,000 a day. Um, that's a lot. That would be uh, if we decided to try to bring in K to 12. If we only decide to bring in K to four or K to six, that cost would be less, but this is a worst case scenario. Um, also associated with this plan are all health and safety costs from the green category that you will hear about from Mr. Hunter and all of the virtual learning costs that you heard about in the red scenario. Thank you. I have a quick question. Oh, sorry. Um, why do I, I don't, I really don't care what the county has to say. I, I mean, they have no oversight unless I'm wrong, Mr. Fitzgerald, they have no oversight 
on this, on, the, on us. I think we have enough of our hands full with what's going on from the state and CDC perspective. Is the county saying something different? Is there, I'm not following why we keep saying what the county's putting forward. I, I think that's coming up now because now we're seeing a, a couple of counties, Chester County and Bucks County in particular, put out certain guidance. Montgomery County has not. Now, how that implicates us in terms of what we can can or can't do based on county guidance goes back to some of our discussion that we had a couple of months ago vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the graduation and whether they have oversight over us. That is an open legal question. Um, our key, the key for us will be what PDE says, and I don't know if they're going to say much more. Um, we'd like to see more guidance out of the county. We might not. So th that, is a, that is one of those unknowns, Mr. Devella, right now in terms of county oversight over us. Right. I mean, but there's, there's, unless the county's saying something specifically different than the state, I'm, I mean, I, I, I just don't, I don't know if we need to add another a layer into something that is going to be pretty much uh, extremely hard to and, achieve. And just for the record, they may not come out with anything. Remember, most counties in the state don't have a county department of health. Right. So if we get something at all, um, you know, we'll have to see how consistent it is with PD and guidance from this. It will mirror something from the state. I, I'm pretty assured in this county, it will mirror what's coming down from the administration. That, um, I have to um, uh, say the same thing, same question is that, but if they don't mirror what the state says, who has priority? Well, if, if, then the state would have priority. So, the, I mean, candidly, there's a most restrictive, which no. would come from the state. And then there's lesser restrictive guidance, which is coming from certain counties right now. Dr. Rockland, Rockland, I'm sorry. Where you have budgetary needs potential, do we have a projected financial exposure that we're using as a guide based on the given time frame? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't hear you. You have a slide that says potential budgetary needs, correct? Yes. So do we have a pie in the sky thought what that cost might be, big picture? Yeah, so um, depending on the scenario we go with, worst case, well, I say worst case scenario, but best case scenario for kids where we can bring them all in. Um, transportation would cost us $20,000 a day. Yeah. And then Bigger. add in big green picture. and red costs as well. That's so, the budget. That's not answer my question. Do we have a big picture cost from 30,000 feet are we looking at a million, potential a million dollars, potential $2 million, $3 million? Well, if, you know, technology costs from red, uh, we saw laptops were, what, 1.7 million? And then, you know, I, what I'm saying is you have to add together all of the costs from all of the scenarios, and that what is what gives you the 30,000-foot view of what this scenario would cost. Right. Does anybody have that? Does anybody have that? In, what is all that added up? What is that total number? Because we Not haven't seen point. green yet, and and what? Not those at this costs point be. because there are too many uh, factors. Well, I'm I'm not asking for an exact. I'm asking for a ballpark. Because right now this presents, you know, this is this is to me this is being short sighted. I think the board would like to see what the potential cost could be. That's all. Agreed. Currently, what we're asking uh, residents to do is to notify us as to their need for transportation services for next year. Uh, so that is happening right now. Once we know that and we get a better idea of what our routes are going to look like, we have a better idea of planning uh, what that transportation, uh, what, how much transportation we're going to need. As we all know, we have a lot of parents who bring their uh, children to school. We have a lot of students at the secondary who drive themselves. So we're trying to get a, a, a real count on a real look at uh, how much do we need. Uh, and that's uh, happening uh, currently. We're getting that information uh, from our community, uh, asking them to basically tell us that they're going to use our transportation. So I think, I think what's important is as, <clears throat> as we start to do these weekly up updates that you're referring to, yes. that um, we need to, we, there needs to be a number. Okay. Right. And that number needs to be, I don't want to see, I, I understand where Clinton's coming because I, I don't want to sit here and say, and I'm not 
this is this is first step. I know we got a long way to go, but I don't want to see a slide where it says, "Well, it's twenty thousand dollars a day plus red or blue or purple phase." What's the numbers? Because well, it'd be nice if that was an easy answer. It's, it's not an easy it's answer. <laughs> it's 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 going to be it's got to be some type of guesstimate yeah. as we proceed forward sure. and as we get more information. Yeah, we got to you know we got to constantly be generating and updating these numbers because you know potentially my personal feeling is is that and I could be completely wrong but my personal feeling is is that we're going to be pushed into a hybrid model come August I think that's where we're going to end up so and we need to really understand and again that's just my personal gut feeling that that's the direction we're going to be pushed and it's really going to be it's going to be extremely important to really really get our arms around these numbers so every week we should see slides or updates that are saying budgetary wise this is where we're at maybe to simplify um if i have this right so since we've only heard red and yellow so far and what the yellow here is that um, the only variable is the transportation, right? So and what I'm hearing is that there's a, there's a sort of a guesstimate at transportation. So, you know, if we enter yellow, we're going to have the virtual learning costs from red. We haven't heard green yet, but those costs associated with green, and then the, the variable for yellow would be the transportation, which would be, we, we just create some sort of a formula and, and guesstimate it, right? Then, then I think that's maybe a, a chart or something. Oh, I think that there's a lot of things there. I, I agree with where you're at a, at a 100,000 foot level. I agree with what you're saying. But personally, at, the, at this stage, I think that there's a lot of things that are missing because is, is the school year, I mean, is the school day extended? Is there more hours in a day that we're going to be able to get all these groups of students through? If that's the case, what's the cost associated to that? I mean, there's a lot of variables that have to be figured out on top of it, just not transportation. I'm sorry, I also have a question about the, um, if you do the half days for the elementary schools, if, if, um, how do you meet the 180 days of, of school requirements if there are only 180 half days? So while students would not be in the classroom, uh, per se, in the school for the entire day, they would be offered online learning that would constitute the rest of the day. So uh, that's when like things like science and social studies and specials would be offered either live or asynchronously to make up the rest of the hours. Are we allowed to ask questions for, I mean, for the, okay, so for, so you, you mentioned an LMS, not necessarily, but the LMS. So, in, and it, you also mentioned that the LMS was sort of, we were gonna do that anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, has there been, uh, sort of we selected an, an LMS vendor and sort of- So that we're not quite ready to finalize it, but we have met with vendors over the last two weeks. We do think we have a final decision. I'm, I wanna tie up some loose ends before speaking out of turn and, and going in that direction, but we had um, teams looking at, various LMSs and, and um, we gathered feedback from every, um, all of the group who looked at them. So yes, we're very, very close. Because those are annual costs. It is, and have. I will say one of the, um, one of the concerns, and I, I forgot to mention it earlier, um, because we are very close to finalizing that LMS piece, we would love to move on that piece, but we know we can't without approval. So that is one of the factors that we're gonna be working with the, um, with the the organization to help us plan through July so we don't lose that time. Um, we would, we are very hopeful and very confident that come July we will bring a proposal for an LMS to you for approval. Um, we're very, very close to doing it now, but um, it's unfortunate just the way that the time falls that we feel like we're gonna miss part of July with our planning and the professional development that happens, but we're gonna try and push through that a little bit as much as we can to do as much as we can on the back end um, with the flexibility that hopefully the organization will give us. Okay, so the red face gave us about three million when I we look at your previous slide, and um, was for the LMS was um, since we were already going to buy that was that partly was that budgeted in already? 
Um, it would not have been because even though we were going to buy it, uh, purchase it, we mm -hmm. our initial plan was more of a two-year plan to move in that direction before COVID. Okay. So that's something that Bob Catalano and I were talking about, but it wasn't worked into the budget this year for that. Um, but that would probably be that first piece. The bulk of the um, of the budget for the red plan is looking at the, the technology. If we were to go and increase our technology, uh, the devices. And is that um, getting one Chromebook per child? What about the ones that we already have distributed? Is so, that yep, the, the K to seven um, factor that you saw would be mm -hmm. getting devices for all students K seven if we were to go to that direction. Um, we are confident that we would have devices eight to 12. Um, we can still distribute the devices that we have. We would get those back. Um, but what we, we already have the plan in place through um, to, to give all students at the high school a device, mm -hmm. and that was already separate. Um, that ball was already rolling ahead of time, and those devices are actually in district already. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that we will reallocate enough to cover eighth grade. Um, and the devices that we've currently distributed would come back, and those would fill in some of the gaps in eighth grade as well. Um, so that number that I provided would be more of a K to seven look. Just so the board understands, and correct me if I'm wrong here, all of these budgetary needs, none of these were budgeted. We don't have money allocated for any of this, just so we all understand that. Good evening, my name is Robert Hunter, Director of Operations, and tonight I will be providing an update to the Green Phase School Reopening Plan based on the work performed by our committee. This slide gives an overview of our committee objective, representation and areas of focus specific to school opening where all students will return back in the classroom. Our group is focused on the must-have requirements PDE has in place for green phase school reopening, which are outlined in this slide. PDE also mentions guidelines that may be included to the extent possible, which we'll cover later in the presentation. Some of the PDE must-haves protect higher risk staff and students. Our committee has made some of the following recommendations that will be included in our plan. Isolate and quarantine symptomatic staff or students. We are currently evaluating space within each facility, which will be designated as an isolation area. As a committee, we are also working on processes and resources needed to support this requirement. Post signage. This will be accomplished by posting signs in highly visible locations that promote everyday protective measures and how to stop the spread of germs. We are currently quantifying materials for pricing as well as verifying if we can fit signage internally. Clean, sanitize, disinfect, and ventilate facilities. Our committee is recommending the district provide disinfecting wipes and make available to all staff throughout all of our schools. We will follow the established written daily cleaning and disinfecting procedures for custodians that address classrooms, bathrooms, locker rooms, and high touch areas. Our committee discussed spray misting entire classrooms with disinfectant on a daily basis, along with the additional costs associated with that. The committee felt the current cleaning and disinfecting procedures are acceptable. This may change if circumstances are different at a later date. We are developing a custodial response team for confirmed COVID-19 cleaning, which will follow CDC guidelines. For ventilation, we will follow ASHRAE recommendations. Some examples are keeping equipment in occupied mode for 24 seven, usage, 72 to 76 degree temperature settings, exhaust fans running 24 seven and provide as much outside air as possible. Safe use of cafeterias and congregate settings. This has been one of the more complicated subject areas our committee has been working on. Currently our recommendation for grades one through four is staggered seating with six students to a 12 student table. This eliminates direct face to face contact. Staggered seating from grades five to 12 is more challenging and may require providing sneeze guards between students and possibly expanding into aux auxiliary gyms with additional folding tables. Key factor for consideration, if limited group gatherings under 250 persons are in place, this may require spreading students out at the Flex and High School buildings at any given lunch period. We also discussed limiting capacity to auditoriums and, gym and gymnasiums for the purpose of spacing.
establish protocols for sporting activities, phys ed classes, and recess. Athletics and marching band will follow the guidance based on the plan sub submitted by Mr. McDaniel. We have been in communication with the phys ed department chair who is developing a plan based on the recommendations from PA State Association of Phys Ed Recreation and Dance. Our committee is still discussing recess related to personal space and equipment use. We are currently in the process of tagging training needs to individuals based on responsibilities within the plan. Professional development will be provided as necessary prior to school opening. In addition to the PDE requirements, face covering, our committee is still in the discussion stage related to students wearing face covering on school buses upon entering and exiting school buildings and while moving throughout the school. Faculty, staff, and visitors will be required to wear face covering outside of classroom settings. Student transportation. We're currently waiting for surveys to come back from parents to help quantify students requiring transportation. Allowable number of students permitted on a bus will be key in development of the transportation plan. Self-reporting. Operation staff are currently using an automated self-reporting form at the start of each workday to be expanded to all employees. Our green phase recommendation will require parents to monitor their child before leaving for school. Currently discuss best practices uh, for, for sharing materials like textbooks and mobile tech equipment. Minimize sharing of classroom materials to essential materials only. Disinfectant wipes provided in each classroom to support that. Restrict non-essential visitors. Schedule visit by appointment only. Parent drop-off items limited to outside of the school. Communication plan. Maintain single point of communication going out to parents and staff. Designate single point of contact with Montgomery County Health Department. So identified here are some of the potential budgetary needs. Hand sanitizer dispensers for classrooms and entrances estimated annual cost of $65,000. That's a hand sanitizer in every classroom and entrance to, to the building. Disinfectant wipes for classrooms, offices, and nurses suites estimated annual cost of $200,000. Sneeze guard for, for reception areas, actual material cost is, is $9,500 and they're being built now for our 12 month staff. Sneeze guards for the high school and middle school lunch tables. Uh, materials have been estimated at $17,250. Additional custodians, custodial services specific to mist disinfect in entire classrooms uh, daily above routine scope of work currently provided, estimated at $95,000. And that's based on 20 hours additional a day, 180 days at 3,600 hours at the agreed upon hourly rate. Thank you. I got a, a couple questions. Um, one is, is, is a PDE requirements or recommendations? The document that we're working off of, these are must haves from PDE. They are must haves. Yes. Is, did, they, did they talk about the student spacing in that? Because I didn't, I didn't hear that they actually defined student spacing within the requirement and anything as of yet. The student spacing uh, comes up in the, uh, the May uh, to the extent possible. So it's, it's not in the, the must have section, it's in the May. Isn't it also in the CDC guidance for reopening? Excuse me? <clears throat> Isn't it also included in the CDC guidance for reopening? So PDE is mandated that we follow the CDC guidance and I believe it's also included in the CDC guidance for reopening. I would have to circle back on that. Yeah. yeah yes. Yes. It, it, they they s reference the CDC in the in the in their document. Yeah. PDs. But this 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 is where it gets confusing, because it's they reference the CDC because I read that and they reference the CDC guidelines and the CDC guidelines are just that guidelines and those guidelines change almost weekly. So my question is is that as a school district, um what are we required to follow? Is, is there anything been established as of yet that we specifically have to require? And that, and I'm, is this what it, I mean? I'd have to put the entire document in front of me to, to isolate there are certain quote unquote must haves, but certainly that document was not binding per se in terms of the totality of the recommendations. There were a number. 
uh, but a lot of it were quote unquote guidelines to the extent feasible. And uh, they are coming out with a, a phase two scenario, which is updated. So there may be things that were in the, the initial document, which is closing in on a month old to what will be in this upcoming document. Okay. And then sneeze guards for cafeteria, is that sneeze guards around every seat? I mean, what, what are we sneeze guarding? No, that's where we can't have um, staggered seating, where students aren't sitting directly across from each other. We would so implement them. And we're actually putting up plexiglass also, or? Yeah, there would be plexiglass uh, freestanding, um, two foot uh, high, four foot long uh, along each table. So we fold, the, we fold these tables up, so they would have to be, all this has to be dismantled at the end of the day? Unless they're attached to the tables. Okay. We're still working through it. All right. And that's fine. I mean, I'd, I'd rather you say we're working through it. We're looking at options. The other question I have is that if we're in a green phase, what does this mean to use of our buildings after school? Because we have no control over anything that goes on at the end of the, at the, end of the school day. So are we opening our buildings up at night to all these different activities? Or what, what's the plan associated to that? And and I, I guess on that too, what about other groups coming in and, and even beyond our own students using our facilities for activities after school, what about other groups as well? I believe we're going to have to have further conversation collectively with all groups. Uh, we, we've been focusing on really the primary goal of getting school open, um, but obviously uh, there, there's a need for that discussion. Well, it's a, it's a big discussion because if we're, if, if what, what's our dis disinfectant plans at night? I mean, that all plays into it. I mean, if you're going to mist or, uh, or fog each of the, the rooms, when is that going to occur? And, and how does that happen? And in, and in the hallways and, and everything else that, and, and, and are we doing this, are we doing this once a day, twice a day? I mean, do we have a, do we know where we're at with that yet? As far as the disinfectant plan that we have in place right now, uh, we instituted it uh, prior to school closing and that's gonna continue. Uh, so that's done at the end of each day, uh, every, every classroom, uh, every bathroom, locker room, um, uh, student occupied area uh, is cleaned first and then spray mist disinfected on the surface areas. Uh, the proposal that we have uh, with the uh, complete room misting is above what we typically, what we did before um, school closure and uh, as far as our health professionals that are in our group um, the the areas that were cleaning and disinfecting they felt that was an acceptable means at this point um, based on um, the, the the way the, um, the the virus is transmitted through um, you know touch surfaces but they, they thought that was an effective means of cleaning and disinfecting so we're not doing any anything midday or anything like that in the well, restrooms or anything we're, we're not at, at this point we were doing daily cleaning at the end of each um, part of the classroom uh, daily uh, I, I guess the regular cleaning that you would ask is that we would it's, it's going to have to be a collaboration uh, within the classroom uh, the disinfectant wipes uh, in every classroom is going to be a support to that for some of the high touch areas we just would not have the resources available um, to be able to go through and, and follow, you know, students and staff around in every classroom and try and hit high touch areas. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I'm, I want to make sure we're being realistic on, you know, if we're required or is it suggested that we have multi cleanings throughout the day for certain areas? I mean, we, whatever plan we had pre-closing is one thing versus whatever plan we're going to have in place come August or September. So, I mean, it's something that we have to think about if there's going to be multi-cleaning air. You talked about disinfectant wipes. Do we know where we're getting them? We, we have a, uh, a quote into one of our uh, co-star vendors uh, that, that can guarantee them before school opening. Mr. DeBello, I just, I want to respond to the point you brought up just to probably add to the confusion, but it certainly the document speaks for itself. Um, the, the, the name of the PD document was, quote, preliminary guidance for phased reopening. Okay. Um, there are what I'll call 10,000 foot um, requirements under the red, green, and yellow phases. It doesn't really give specificity that they, they, they punt on that to the LEA. 
And then in the, the, fo the following section is where they give what I'll call plan requirements, but again, more at the 10,000 foot level. And then, a, and then a section called possible considerations. The possible considerations, again, are, are non-binding. And most of this stuff was, again, 10,000 foot recommendations. Okay, and then that leads me to my other question is that what's the liability of the school district if this stuff is put out there and then we don't do something that's, well, uh, I, I don't even know what, what the right words to use because all this stuff is like suggested, you know, required or to the best of your ability because look, to the best of our ability, we don't have to do any of it because it's going to cost a fortune, right? So what, I mean, What's the liability on the, and I'm only being facetious on that, but what's, what's the liability of the district? Well, um, in well that, uh, maybe we don't know. Well, no, I, I, I'd be more than happy to share that with you. I think, for, uh, and, and the, I would be more specific in, in a legal context with you in the back, but I would say generally speaking, remember, rem remember, we are covered under the Political Subdivision Tort Claims Act. So when it comes to the general issue of liability, for, for a district, I think it's relatively small. Now, if we put a plan into place, I would suggest we implement it with fidelity. And, and, and that's, I agree. And that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to get to as far as what, what, what's, what are we putting in place? And we have to be careful because I, I, I'm totally on, in sync with what you're saying. Bear, bearing in mind that as a district and as a, a board, we are most interested in the safety and well-being of our students too. Absolutely, but it, it's, it's really balancing. I mean, if, are we doing everything that's put out there? Is, I mean, between CDC, WHO, and Pennsylvania PDE, and the governor's office, are we going to implement everything that comes out of each one of those? And when I say WHO, it's the World Health Organization, not the WHO, the band. Uh, <laughs> but it's... You know, we gotta, we gotta keep it lighthearted, but, but I mean, are we, what do we, where do we draw the line? I mean, are we, are we, it's, it's, it's obviously we want to do everything possible to keep everyone safe. I mean, that's what we always do here at Spring Forward, but where are we, where are we drawing the line as far as what are we trying to, or what do we have to achieve here? I just want to say one thing <clears throat> to the presenters. The board's asking a lot of questions because we have a lot of questions. We know this is a first pass. Um, so a lot of these things are going to come up. And, you know, you guys go back and to the best of your ability, try to answer the questions and put forth a, com a, a complete packet on the 22nd. Okay. 20th. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Gooden, one of the additional concerns with when we're looking at the feasibility going forward too would be that professional development. Um, we're going to have, I think, the three in-service days before school starts, probably would not be having the large gathering at the district level and maybe taking advantage of that time That's and kind of a plan in place of how um, to provide that professional development. That's correct. Uh, you're absolutely right. One of the things that, uh, that I'm not sure who just mentioned it, but we have been focused on how to open school, how to get students back, being educated, get our staff back to work. One of the topics that came up today or came up this week, uh, or excuse me, last week um, in our discussions has to do with uh, the use of the facilities after, after hours. That is something we have to decide. We have, uh, if, you, if you are aware of the district, you know that the buildings are used nonstop every evening. And we have to make a decision as a district uh, about that usage. Uh, we have a lot of groups, um, home and school groups, uh, outside groups. We have a lot of those. And really our focus right now has been trying to figure out a, a realistic plan uh, under those three scenarios of how we could actually open school uh, because the state will tell us what phase we're in um, uh, come August. But the big looming question out there, and it, it's just been, uh, it's, it's right there, it's been brought out. What do we do with the outside groups? What do we do with the after school use? Um, and quite frankly, we, we've not tackled that yet. So we're not prepared to make a recommendation, but we know it's out there. We know that's a question. And I could probably name off 20 other questions 
uh, that we're trying to tackle. But for right now, we're, we're really focused on how to get a plan for kids to be back in school. But there are other issues out there that we're going to have to deal with uh, as we're moving along. Well, that most certainly, I would think, would have to be the decision of that would have to be part of the green plan. I mean, you, you can't execute your green plan without making that decision because that's going to play into what your green, what, well, I, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, you don't have to answer it now. I'm just yeah. saying that it's got to be part of that. It has to be. Right, I mean, sure. it's, I think that, I think for the public and for those that are here and the, and the, I mean, you have to, from our perspective, from a board perspective, administration perspective, and a group that's working so hard and diligently on this, you have to understand that there's things out there that are, I mean, they're talking about where on buses a kid has to sit every other seat. So we could basically put on, a, on one of the long buses that typically seat 40 to 50 kids, we're looking at potentially putting 10, 12 kids on a bus. That's one thing that we're, we're looking at, right? That's and this is, this is all part of what's being put out there, putting out there about staggered times. And it was mentioned about the, uh, about the virtual learning, but that's also, if we go back to school, they're talking about staggered times. They're talking about social distancing in the classroom, about distancing with students six feet around. So on a classroom that typically has, you know, between 20 and 25 kids on average, you're looking at bringing that down probably to 50% if we're lucky. I mean, not using cafeterias, not feed i mean i don't even understand that one how how they think we're going to feed you know the kid just pick an elementary school how we're going to feed 600 kids if we're not using the cafeteria i mean so these are all the things that you know we're struggling with as far as and this is what this group and i think they're doing a, an, an excellent job you know with the minimal guidance and information that that you could work on it's as clear as mud right everything that you the decisions that you have to make so th these are significant significant things that we have to work through because and i and, and you know and I, I totally agree with you this is all about providing the best you know safe clean healthy environment for our students and our and our and our staff but again it's it's these guidelines are you know when it becomes unrealistic for a school district of 8000 students what we can and cannot do and none of that's, it's, it's easy for Harrisburg to sit there and say, you need to do these things. Well, you're hearing this evening, we're already in the millions. We're already talking millions of dollars that are unbudgeted. And we, don't, we still don't know where this is going. So this, this, is, a, this is a giant task. And I, and I have parents contact me all the time and ask me, well, what are we going to do? What are we doing? I, I, we don't have answers yet. And I have parents telling me they're not, their kids aren't coming to school. They're not wearing masks. I have other parents telling me their kids are coming to school and they, they, they will refuse to come to school if they can't wear a mask. And, and it's like, I mean, this, the stuff is like, you know, so I know if the public, I mean, bear with us as, and parents bear with us because nobody, and Dr. Good, you're part of the superintendent group in Montgomery County. That's 22 school districts. And you're hearing this, what? Is, I mean, among all my colleagues, we're all in the same boat. Every district's in the same boat. We're, we are all heavily uh, leaning on the verbiage of to the extent possible. Yeah, well, we're interpreting it to the extent possible that we're able to do. Um, so, and you I, brought I up some, some unrealistic this, issues. That this triggered a little bit. Um, even in the green phase, which we're supposed to go to on the 26th, correct? Even in the green phase, you can only have gatherings up to 250, is that correct? That's so, my understanding. So with that, what are the thoughts on those um, senior celebrations that we talked about for the summer? Um, has, has there been any more thought given to that? Because even in green, it doesn't look like we're going beyond 250 people. No. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we'll, we'll operate within that, um, within those guidelines. Uh, and if that's the max that we can have in, that's the max that we can have in. Uh, I know that I believe preliminarily, uh, Dr. Nugent and I have talked about uh, splitting some of those events into smaller groups. Uh, so you'd have more than one event. You might have two or three, depending on the number of, uh, number of students who actually sign up for that. 
but we are going to we're, we're going to try to stay as close to the guidelines as we possibly can uh, to the extent possible. Well, well, thank you all for all of your efforts. Uh, I know that there was a presentation that was given to us at the curriculum meeting and you've done a lot of work on that plan since then and boy it shows and we know that there'll be a lot more that you'll you'll do and, and and go with the flow with because there really is no other no other choice on that but we appreciate all of your efforts and look forward to the information that you can continue to um, model the, these plans and and we'll get through it so thank you all for that.